Namaste. I'm Johannes Broadwell and I'm here from Agile India with Corey Haynes. Hello. It's, uh, hello. <laughs> it's uh, great to finally meet you. I've been uh, doing uh, I've been uh, f doing some of the stuff that you've been teaching for a few years. So it's Yeah, uh, I see your name all over the place. So it's good to meet you in more than just like a little tiny picture. So. <laughs> yeah. It's um uh, so you gave two talks at the conference mm -hmm. today. Yes. One of them was sort of just thoughts and lessons I've learned over the last 10 years of practicing XP. Mm -hmm. I got introduced to it in 2004, and so this is sort of 10 years on. And so it was just kind of just sort of some ideas and thoughts and lessons I've had around some of the technical practices and some of the team practices and just things I've seen that um, I've taken into myself and work. Um, the second talk was a much more code heavy. Very, it was uh, about the four rules of simple design and some of the lessons I've learned in applying those at code retreats, working with the people, the participants, and making comments about them and you know, doing very small, subtle design decisions. Right. All right. So let's mm -hmm. start with there's two things there that I don't think everybody knows. So okay. what's the four rules of simple design? So the four rules of simple design, they were codified by Kent Beck in the end of the late 90s. And the first is that your tests pass. All right. Which doesn't really matter how good your design is if you can't prove <laughs> it works. Um, the second is that it expresses intent or really good names. Okay. Like really pay attention to what the code, how the code reads. Um, the third is no duplication, or the dry principle a lot of people have heard about, the don't repeat yourself principle. And that one is a really about duplication of knowledge rather than sort of the mechanical duplication that we oftentimes think of. of oh, well, here's two pieces of code that look the same. Let me eliminate duplication. But really looking at the knowledge points of your system. So what would be an example of uh, knowledge duplication? So, for example, one of the ones that I gave was in Conway's Game of Life, which is the sort of domain that I was giving examples in. Oftentimes you'll see, because the problem is on a two-dimensional grid, mm -hmm. you'll often see people passing around X, Y. Oh, a bunch yes, of, methods. of course. This is really the knowledge of the topology. Right. And so eliminating that duplication as soon as you see it causes you to think about what are those x y represent so you reify it into something like a location object or right. something and so that's really knowledge as opposed to this mechanical uh, there's two things that look similar so as mm -hmm. a sort of if you think ahead a lot mm -hmm. which i don't know if we're supposed to do no <laughs> uh, then if you put it into location, then mm -hmm. you can add a third coordinate without changing your code. Exactly. Is exactly. that good or bad? It's very good. Um, the whole goal of simple design, the point of design in general, is to make it easy to change. But you can't know what needs to change, so you're not building systems that are like ultimately configurable that you right. can do that. But by really extracting out these knowledge centers, you get the right classes. You get the right abstractions. And they it's happenstance that you end up finding that, oh, well, making a change to the dimensionality is there. Um, another benefit that comes out of it is you get what I call behavior attractors, which is when it comes time to add a new method, say you need to find the neighbors mm -hmm. of a certain mm -hmm. cell, oftentimes you'll have a method that's like neighbors of Something. Excellent. Yeah. And there's that question of where do you put these methods? Right. And you Oh, that's a static method, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it's a static method, of course. <laughs> um, and so oftentimes we will just like, well, I'm in this file right now, so I'm just going <laughs> to put it here and wait. But if we extract knowledge into domain objects, then they tend to be natural places for behavior. So a location object, which you created by extracting this duplication is a natural place to find a method that has to do with the topology, such as give me the neighbors for a location. And so you sort of accidentally have these 
domain objects which naturally attract the behaviors that you're trying to build. As someone here at the conference uh, talked, uh, mentioned the word serendipitous design, yes. I think. Yes, yeah, that's a great way <laughs> to talk about it. Is it's, it's just like, oh, hey, I already have a location. <laughs> that makes sense to put it there. So there, um, the fourth one real quick. Yes, yes. The fourth one is small. Right. Which is, once you've done your refactorings with two and three, make sure that you don't have anything there that you don't need. So that would be pencil the test, uh, good names, no duplication, and small. Yep. Good. And that's the, the goal of talking about the four rules for me is that I've, over the years, come to, come to sort of think of them as the sort of the generators of all the other design guidelines that we have. So just by applying these, you end up with things that abide by the solid principles, you find sort of design patterns come out, and so you find a lot, the law of Demeter just sort of falls out oftentimes. Yeah. Um, and so just over the years, I've gotten to where I, I pretty much just use the four rules, and I use the others as more of a descriptive form. So if you take a step back mm -hmm. here, I'm just uh, um, when you talk about design, uh, mm -hmm. What's the process of design like when you work with code? Um, there's, a, there's a couple different layers of design. So there's always like the sort of the system design and the, the upfront thinking about how might I put together my system. Mm -hmm. um, I like to do that on a whiteboard, uh, you know, I, drawing pictures and things. I like to say that it's great to do upfront design, but it should remain where it belongs, which is on the whiteboard. <laughs> and then you go in and let that be a guide for you as you write your code. And so I tend to use test-driven development as my design methodology. And so I'll go in, you know, you write your test, write enough code, and then refactor. And I refactor according to the four rules, really the middle two. So the example where you have uh, the int x, int y, mm -hmm. and you extract the location, that would be a refactoring happen. Yes. Yeah. So why, why, don't, why not do it right the first time? Um, I'm not a very good developer. <laughs> that's, I mean, honestly, that's what it comes down to is the majority of the uh, experience I have and the design I have, or the design experience, has shown me that if I think very hard, I can come up with a reasonable design. If I think very hard and let refactoring guide me, then I come up with something better. And just to reiterate, the whole goal that I have for design is being able to change it easily in the future, regardless of what the change is. Right. And so because I've found that I can do better if I think hard and use my test to guide me, that's the way I like to do it. Um, and so just let it fall out. Things come out as they, uh, as they come out. And you also, you know, it might not be the location, you know, extracting this was the best thing. Yeah. And so you can move it back and forth. And I mean, it's over time, design should change as you get more knowledge about the domain. I found that often pair programming is in, an interesting tool in that sense. When I was less experienced and mm -hmm. I pair program, if I would pair program something with someone that I had done before, mm -hmm. I would very quickly try and force the design mm -hmm. down the path I'd done before. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I tend to, Ron Jeffries, I believe, told me one time, a great anecdote that I, or a, a saying that I, like to remember and he said that when he first started pairing he would always fight for his design yeah and over time he got to the point where when there was a disagreement about what design path to go down he would always yield to the other person knowing that if he was if he was if the other person was right he would learn something <laughs> and if the other person was wrong the he was a good enough developer and his techniques were good enough so that they would find out uh, soon enough to shift the design over and to fix it. And so trusting your skills, trusting your techniques that you use to fix any problems that you have. Hey, isn't courage one of the core Courage XP, right? is one of the core XP <laughs> values. So. 
So I think that's, that kind of comes down to seeing that in your behavior and trying, trying new things. Mm -hmm. So the other word that, um, that, we, that you touched on in the beginning is a code retreat. So mm -hmm. what's a code retreat? So a code retreat is a day-long workshop that is entirely focused on practice, like really low-level kind of design practice and technique practice. Um, it was, we came up with the idea, me and three other guys, Patrick Welsh and I and Hadra Alala and Gary Bernhardt, about five years ago now. And over the years, really uh, evolved and settled on the format. And so it's a day-long workshop. We work on uh, pretty much Conway's Game of Life. Um, and you work for 45 minutes, paired up. And every 45 minutes, you delete all the code and swap pairs and start again. And then every session, the facilitator introduces a new set of constraints for you to sort of investigate the problem with. So things like um, no if statements, or no primitives across method boundaries, or no return values, or these you know methods less than three lines. And so you introduce constraints that sort of jolt the developer out of how they would normally do it. Because right. so, like you had taught, said earlier, you tend to have this idea of how to develop it or how to build it. And so you, it's really hard to break out of that. You think, this is how I'm going to do it. This is how I'm going to do it. But by introducing constraints that keep yeah. the person from doing it that way, they have to come up with new um, ideas. And so it's a day of really like just really low level practicing coding techniques. So wh why would someone want to go to a code retreat for a whole day? Well, some of the stuff that I've heard people say at the end of it is it, you know, it really opens up your mind to alternate ways to solve problems, alternate ways to look at uh, building software. Because we force you out of your comfort zone, you have to look at different things. And the other great thing about it is because we delete the code every 45 minutes, it's a safe place to um, experiment. Yeah. Because I tell people that no matter how bad it is, on average, 22 and a half minutes later, it will disappear into the ether. <laughs> and it doesn't matter. And so you get this opportunity to try new things. A lot of people come and they've never paired before. And so it's a day of... A, a day of safely learning about pairing or safely learning about TDD and since we don't show the code to anybody we don't go and present it on a monitor it's okay to make mistakes it's okay to struggle it's okay honestly to write no code like right. to struggle so hard that you can't write that test I sometimes I tell people that write you know take a session and Focus so hard on the tests, so hard that maybe you only write one or two, but they're the right ones. And having that practice means that when you go back to your work and when you go back to the grind of deadlines and having to keep your code and all of that, you've, you've practiced a little bit. So it's a little bit easier to do it in your day-to-day -day job. And, um, and it's a fun day. Like any time you get developers together to code, you've got a good day. Yeah. I've, I'll have first time facilitators contact me and you know be nervous about, I, I don't think I'm a great developer or I don't know if I have anything to offer as a facilitator. And I tell them that if you just kind of go by the format and you just get people together to code, and the format fun. is freely available on the net at it's coderetreat.org? It's coderetreat.org. The format's there. We have some sample um, constraints that, are, that people have. Um, it's not the best organized site, but <laughs> um, it's, it's up there. Jim Hearn and uh, Adi Balboaka, they are really kind of leading the global community now. They're, they're sort of stepping up into these well, have stepped up into very much leadership role in sort of the global community around Code Retreat. So I can um, definitely say that a Code Retreat's changed my life. That's, that's a great thing to say. That's, I like hearing that. <laughs> All right. Are you ready for the lightning round? 
Absolutely. <laughs> so during the lightning round, I'll ask a question and okay. you should answer it as quickly as possible. Okay. And then you will ring the bell so you can test oh. it out. Okay. Yes, that's good enough. That's good enough. Is All that right. when I answer the question? That's when you answer the question okay. uh, um, completely. Okay. All so, right. So uh, what is your favorite programming language? I would say Ruby. And what's your favorite uh, um, coding kata? Who my favorite coding kata? I lately I've really enjoyed the Roman numeral kata, the converting numbers to Roman numerals. It's so simple and is just a really fun one to do. Okay. Um, and uh, you said you had learned uh, from from thousand examples of game of life. What's mm -hmm. the most important thing that you've learned? Um. write code. Um, a lot of people will spend a lot of time discussing and there's a thing I say that I'll find people who have been talking for 20 minutes and I'll come over and I'll say, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a linguist or, uh, you know, language historian, but I don't think English was intended to talk about software design. And you're sitting in front of a language that was explicitly built to talk about software design. So along with the conversation, if you have an idea, write some pseudocode or write some code. And that way, there can be no confusion about what you're thinking about. Um, and I've learned that. So would you like to repeat the short answer? Oh, the short answer? Yeah. Um, well, write code. Great. Communicate through code. I talk a lot. Thank you very much, Corey. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. <laughs>